Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 116 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, guest geeks Matt London, Allison Hayslip, and David Wexler will be joining me to share our childhood memories of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and to discuss the new movie. But first up, we've got an interview with science fiction author Stephen Gould. His first novel, Jumper, was one of my favorite books growing up, and I got to meet Steve back in 2004 when he was one of my instructors at the Viable Paradise Writers Workshop. In 2008, Jumper was adapted into a big-budget movie starring Samuel L. Jackson and Hayden Christensen that bears almost no resemblance to the book. Steve is now working with James Cameron on the upcoming Avatar sequels, and is also the current president of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. The fourth book in his Jumper series, Exo, is out now. And now, here's our interview with Stephen Gould. All right, so we're here with Stephen Gould. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Okay, and so your new book is called Exo, and it's a sequel to Jumper. And as I mentioned in the intro, Jumper was one of my favorite books growing up, so I'd just like to start out and talk a bit about that. So for people who haven't read Jumper, what's it about? So Jumper is about a teenager who discovers under very unpleasant circumstances that he has the ability to teleport. And he um, he does so, you know, and under the sort of circumstances anyone would want to be someplace else. It's also the reason the book was one of the top 100 banned books in America from 1990 to 1999. Mm. Well, I mean, maybe you want to explain a little bit more about why it got so banned? Well, it was banned for two reasons, uh, or a combination of reasons. It was a best book for young adults from the American Library Association, which means it goes into a lot of libraries, including uh, middle grade libraries uh, as well as high school libraries. And then the two most objectionable scenes for a parent are on page two and page nine. So they were able to just pick up this book that their child has brought home from the library and and turn to something that uh, they found awful. So on page two, we have a scene of impending child abuse by a parent. And then on page nine, we have a scene of impending uh, sexual assault by a group of people on the same child. And so in both cases, these are the impetus for jumping. But um, I don't know. For some reason, uh, some parents look at something in a book and see something awful happening and think if their child reads that, it's going to happen to them, which to me just doesn't make sense. Um, I think actually... In this case, we're talking about a runaway kid, a kid who's run away. And uh, I think it's a valuable thing for people to know that maybe if you run away as a young teen, you might be subject to predation. And so you might want to think about this. Yeah, and now, so when you wrote the book, was that on your minds that these two horrifying scenes were right at the beginning and that people might have that sort of reaction to the book? or Not at all. Um the main point was I needed two horrible things to happen that would, if you had this ability, would be the cause. It would be the impetus to exercise that ability, right? You know, if you're going to uh, do something unusually difficult or just unusual, uh, you kind of need the motivation. And that's why I put those right at the beginning. Well, so now, now tell us about this unusual ability. I mean, you say that Davy develops this ability to teleport. Like, say a little bit more about how did you get interested in writing about teleportation and how did you want to depict it in your story? Well, teleportation has always been one of those great things. Um, those, if I had one ability, you know, one paranormal ability, what would it be? And teleportation has always been up there for me. Uh, if for no other reason than all that time you spend in an airport, uh, terminal waiting for uh, canceled flights or flights that are delayed and so on. Um, that's a good reason right there. But 
really the book is about escape. Um, teleportation is a metaphor for escape, for leaving a situation that is just totally and completely un um, endurable, right? So you want to get away from it. Um, and I too was a, like Davy, I too was a child of an active alcoholic when I was a teenager. Uh, and and I, my father, fortunately, uh, has been sober for over 30 years now. But at that time, he was a, an active alcoholic and emotionally abusive. Um, and so I was working on issues of my own there, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, now you say that teleportation is treated as a metaphor in this book, but the book does treat the teleportation in a very scientifically rigorous way, or at least a very, um, you know, it thinks through very carefully all the practical implications. It's not treated in a magical sort of a way. That's true. Um, while teleportation itself is probably not possible, uh, the um i am very very consistent in looking at the implications of the kind of teleportation i have which is sort of like opening a hole between two places two different places and what that requires for instance um one of the early things he discovers or in jumper is that he cannot he does not carry momentum with him when he teleports or he doesn't have to carry momentum with him. He finds when falling off a sh low cliff that um, he teleports away. And when he is at his location, he has none of the downward velocity you know, that he was carrying when he teleported away. And so he starts thinking about it. And he realizes that he goes from higher and lower latitudes on Earth all the time which would change his rotational velocity by several hundred kilometers an hour. And if he was carrying those changes in velocities, he would appear at different places and smash through the closest wall uh, at, you know, at lethal, with lethal impact. I, in all four books, I've been very careful about, uh, well, each of the... Um, the four books do things with teleportation that the previous book has not done. I'm very careful to stay true to the original implications and the original conditions in the first book. Right now, so in terms of the first book and teleportation, how much of that was, this is how I think teleportation ought to work, and how much of it was, here's the story I want to tell, and so I need to make the teleportation work in such a way that I can tell this kind of story I want to tell? You know, I think um, the way teleportation works in the book started out as having to be that way because of um, the needs of the story. But once I had those certain circumstances, then I was going on from there to, well, if that's the case, then what? does that imply? And that started driving various aspects of the story. Mm -hmm. I mean, could you give an example of that maybe that's not a spoil, not too much of a spoiler? Um, well, the, the fact that you could, if you're going between two, through a doorway, it's not really a doorway, but let's say you're, you're going through a Davy-shaped hole. Davy is forming a Davy-shaped hole between two places. And then he's going through that hole. But if he's chained to a physical object on one end of that thing with handcuffs, um, it doesn't do him any good. He actually starts to go through that hole and nearly dislocates his arm as a result. So there were some implications that then that had for the, you know, the following book, Reflex. And as a result, that drove something from the, the second book involving opening a hole between two places and leaving it open. Well, and, that's, and that this idea that if he gets handcuffed, for example, he can't just jump away um, is consistent with teleportation as you've laid it out. But it also increases the drama because it makes it easier for you as the author to put him in danger because he can't just automatically escape from any dangerous situation he gets himself into. Right. Exactly.
And he's in a lot of dangerous situations <laughs> uh, in these books. He is. Um, he is, and in the second two, four, uh, the, the last two books, which he's in, uh, but the main character in those last two books is his daughter, so who she is also in various dangerous positions. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, and I think one thing, I mean, when I read this book as a kid, it, the first book, it deals a lot with terrorism. And that was very, that really made a big impression on me. And I think you moved more, you moved away from terrorism in the subsequent books. Do you want to talk about why you decided to make that transition? Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, the first book was written in 1990, between 1990 and 1991. Uh, we are nine years pre. 9-11, you know, so at that time, though, there were the biggest problem with terrorism were various hijackings, some that involve a lot of deaths. There was a infamous hijacking of the Aquila Laura cruise ship, and I thought that would make an, this would be something that a guy who could teleport could do something about. And so that became one of the plot elements of of the first book. But then I sold, um, I had written three other books after Jumper before coming back to that thing. And so I decided I was ready to, to write a story about um, about what would happen if Davy did get captured and someone held on to him for a long time. And I started that book, and 9-11 happened. And several of the scenes in the first Jumper book, you know, besides dealing with terrorism, take place at the World Trade Center, uh, and outside the tra World Trade Center. And, um, you know, while I was not going to do, um, I was not doing specific, terrorism in um in the second book already i actually had to put down the book for like uh, nine months just while i was dealing with you know that aftermath and didn't finish it until sometime in 2003 right and and then uh sort of more corporate evil corporations and government agencies Move to the forefront as the adversaries in the book. That's true. Sort of this uh, this corporate or megacorp kind of shadow organization that is manipulating world events because of um, to de to increase their profit of their various uh, corporations to that have enough power to you know motivate uh, world leaders or and so on to behave in certain ways or they have people in government at various places. Uh, and unfortunately, that, while not a true thing, uh, the way corporations started behaving in the early 2000s, or had been behaving for a long time, but it became more and more apparent that corporations were far more concerned with corporate profits than they were what was good for society or good for, you know, the world in general. I'm. I must admit, I'm. I'm motivated to a certain extent by that kind of thing in the uh, when I chose them as ongoing villains. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so now you mentioned that um, Davy has a daughter who shows up later in the series, and I heard you say that your publisher actually thought the books were becoming too YA and they wanted you to. Um, kind of uh, add more adult characters, or, or add the, I guess, in the viewpoints of the adult characters to to pull the books back from being too YA. Well, uh, I must admit that was sort of a response to the first book impulse. That um, when I first turned it in, uh, it was strictly had the um, the viewpoint, first person viewpoint of uh, Scent, the daughter. Um, I'm not sure if it was the YA aspect itself or just that it was so different from the previous books. So I actually went back in and added 
viewpoint scenes from Davy and Millie, which are third person scenes, that then gave you a different viewpoint and a few different things that they're dealing with in parallel with sense story. In a sense, uh, I, I sort of have, uh, John Scalzi to thank in that looking at what he did with uh, The Last Colony and then going back to the same story with, uh, is it Zoe's Tale? That, uh, that you could do interesting things around the same events. So I was dealing with sort of an, a secondary storyline going on by adding those other scenes. And they were much happier with that. Mm -hmm. I think that sort of is indicative, though, of how these books kind of straddle the boundary between YA fiction and adult fiction. I don't know if those categories even existed at the time you wrote the original Jumper, but I mean, these, these books clearly strike a big chord with teenagers, as I know from personal experience. I mean, sort of what sort of, in it, to what degree do you see them as books for teens and what sort of responses do you get from teens in particular to them? Well, I've always, for me, there have always been my response to, um, to my introduction to science fiction, the stuff that just thoroughly, thoroughly got me early on were the Heinlein juveniles, which was what they called them back then, but the books that were targeted at teens. But those books have been published continuously now for, I don't know, 50 years, over 50 years, and um, they have always had both a YA audience and an adult audience because the books are written in such a way that uh, either can read them. And that's sort of where I've been living with my fiction for the last, you know, for my career. Um, and I've had kids with, uh, you know, abusive home life email me and say, you know, this book, this book saved my life or this book you know, let me get away in a way that wasn't physical, but it let me know there are other people out there having things happen that, you know, that were comparable to mine and that they got through them and they survived and they and they had a life afterwards. So there have been people who have responded well to that. And in fact, even if you aren't having uh you know, if you don't have an alcoholic parent who's who's uh, heaping out tons of abuse on you, when you're a high school kid, when you're a kid at that age, you know, going, working, trying to work the transition between, you know, childhood and adulthood, everything is wrong and everything is messed up. I mean, look at, um, I mean, the old Joss Whedon thing. Um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, that worked so well because high school is hell. <laughs> no matter <laughs> what, high school is hell. Well, I guess, I, and I understand you have two daughters now, I think one of whom or maybe both of whom are teenagers. And so you're seeing this now um, from the parent side of things. Is that I imagine from your books that this is affecting your storytelling as well? Absolutely. Uh, I say that, um, you know, all of the Jumper books you know, are very personal in that uh, they had to do with my own life. So we've already talked about how Jumper, the first one, was about my life, but uh, the book uh, Reflex starts with an argument uh, between, it's 10 years after, roughly 10 years after, you know, the first book and 10 years after the first book within the book's timeline where uh, Millie and Davy are arguing about whether or not to have kids. And, and uh, you have Davy being uh, reluctant because he didn't have the best parenting and he's afraid of inflicting uh, similar trauma upon his own kids. And, uh, and I had that exact same argument with my wife, right? I was, it was a concern. It was something we we're going through. So, um, and then... Uh, jump another 
a large time period and I have teenage daughters uh, at the time, I wrote Impulse. Uh, actually, one of my daughters was already in college at the time I wrote Impulse, but the other daughter was in uh, middle high school. And uh, so very much her struggles with uh, with social uh, events in her life, you know, being able to deal with that. Plus the fact that, you know, Davy undergoes some significant trauma in uh, the second book, Reflex. So he's sort of got a little bit of PTSD stuff going on that he has to struggle with and his daughter has to struggle with for her to be able to, you know, have a life because he's a little paranoid and he's got very good reason to be paranoid, but that doesn't mean he should be uh, clamping down on his teenage daughter. So, again, it's about me dealing with that boundary of where do you draw lines on your daughter's, you know, activities? Where do you, um, at what point do you let them struggle with their own problems and come up with their own answers and figure it out? So, it's again, it's it's my life. And in this last one, you know, again, there's some of that, uh, as I'm familiar with. But at this point, uh, the, in this last one, we're dealing with some stuff that is almost more wish fulfillment than the uh, than all three books, all the other three books put together. In a way, it goes back to me again as a uh, teenage boy. And watching, uh, I think I was 14 years old, when I saw on this little four-inch television, uh, black and white television in in my kitchen in Honolulu, Hawaii, watch Neil Armstrong walk on the moon, right? So the desire for space travel, the desire for to be able to get out there has definitely influenced the very last book. And and I have to say, uh, uh, Canadian commander Chris Hadfield <laughs> deeply influenced that book in a way. Oh, that, that's interesting. I mean, he was actually our guest on episode 100. He did two things that I think were phenomenal. Obviously, any astronaut who makes it into space and the, and the, and the guys who stay for months in the International Space Station are all phenomenal people, but the way he engaged the public with social media and, in addition, the way he showed that space travel, that the expression of, of some form of art in space travel, you know, in, in engaging the public in about science and about, you know, the dreams and aspirations of, of exploration you know, were two fabulous things. You know, the music bit and the uh, famous uh, Shatner tweets. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Well, yeah, I mean, let's talk about the the latest book, Exo, which, as you say, deals with space exploration in a way. You want to talk about that and, and why is it called Exo? Well, it's called Exo because all of the books are single-word, two-syllable titles but but yeah exo means outer out uh outside like exoplanets are planets that are outside our solar system and so on so this was getting outside of our atmosphere in this case okay i i, I thought maybe it had to do with exosuit or something like because uh, the character sent in the book is starting to use her teleportation power to try to get higher and higher into the sky and see how far she can go when she gets to the point where she starts needing a uh, a high altitude suit to keep her safe. Yeah, and that's true. But exo also means, you know, outside. So she wants to go outside. <laughs> I guess it's <laughs> a metaphor for childhood too. You know, that point where parents want you to stay in the yard. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a time when you want to go outside the yard. So, and she does. And they have issues, right? They have things going on with, um, again, the same old corporation that are trying to get them. And 
And besides wanting to get into space, because that's just cool, <laughs> it is just plain cool, um, uh, I think she also had the realization that, you know, here's some place they can't follow me. They can't mess with us. Well, yeah, and, and I mean, this book has such a quality that I associate with science fiction novels I read when I was a kid of having this incredible excitement about space travel and the mechanisms of space travel. I can, I can really imagine kids reading this book and getting interested in being astronauts or being, you know, space scientists, things like that. That would please me more than anything. And going all the way back to those Heinlein juveniles, this is definitely a response as well to how space it will travel. Uh, I hadn't thought about it enormously, but it's just so clear in retrospect. Now I've read that book so many times. Of course, in that book, all the bad guys are actually out in space, <laughs> but uh, but still, and and also there's some stuff about the other. Um, you know, we've got. We've done better over the years. Uh, we've had far more nations, far more genders, far more ethnicities of people who've gone into space. But there's this definite sense of, you know, it's the it's the Western Civ white guys thing, right? And I definitely wanted to open up some of that. Well, yeah, and I mean, the character of Sense in this book has a very strong feminist um, outlook. Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, she uh, <laughs> uh, jokes about manned missions and stuff like that. Right. When someone talks about a manned mission, she says, no, it's a womaned mission. <laughs> yeah. Um, and in fact, it's nice. I was, uh, so, you know, I have this current gig with uh, James Cameron. And we were having, we had a lot of conversations about among space travel, among other things. And one of the things I noticed after, over and over again, he, he was talking about, you know, the potential Mars stuff. And, and he never said manned mission once. Whenever he was talking about a mission that involved humans on board, he would call it a piloted mission. And uh, I found that impressive. Hmm, that's interesting. I mean, do you want do you want to say a little bit more about for people who don't know about what your involvement with James Cameron is? Oh, sure. I was um I was hired uh, to both be in the room while we worked on uh the plots for the next 3 Avatar films. And then I am currently working on writing corresponding books for those uh for the four movies, which includes the first movie which has never been uh, made into a uh, a novel. So, so you're actually having creative input on the upcoming movies. Uh, I had I was in the room for five months with four screen four wonderful screenwriters and James Cameron and uh, and a writer's assistant and an archivist and we um, we were working on plot for plots and and details for all that time. It was. Uh, yeah, no, I'd say we all had input. I mean, we all were actively working on ways to, though, without a doubt, uh, Cameron had this this skeleton in the arc, uh, this this overarching idea for these movies that uh, that was in place ahead of it. But uh, we all helped, you know, to fill that out. And I imagine you can't say much about it, but I mean, is there literally anything you can say about uh, the content of those movies or what you contributed or anything like that? No, uh, not what I, I, I really can't say what, um, uh, I can say that, uh, you know, we're talking, you know, there are 12 people who've walked on the moon, right? There are only three people who have been to the bottom of the Challenger Deep, <laughs> and one of those was James Cameron. So I will say, it's safe to say that um, there will be water. <laughs> <laughs> there will be ocean in uh, in as part of these movies, and he said that in public, so I'm okay about saying that. 
All right, cool. Well, I mean, you've had uh, some other dealings with Hollywood, right? You, uh, your novel Jumper was turned into a, a movie, um, and we had some people wanting me to ask you about that. Um, so, so Jason Gurley says, I'd love to hear some inside bits about the movie adaptation and what he thought of it. Uh, so is there any, uh, any inside info you can give us about, about the Jumper movie? Uh, sure, I can tell you a few things. Um, if I have any disappointment, it's that they didn't tell their own story as well as they should. They could have, I think. Yes, it was not an ad adaptation after roughly 15 minutes or so, which kind of you can see resemblance in the book. They go off in places that are not, um, you know, that were not in the book at all. Though they still incorporate elements that are, you know, from Jumper. But mostly it's, it's, they wanted multiple jumpers. They wanted these paladins who hunt down and kill jumpers. So, but I thought that they could have done a better job with their story. I think they cut it too short. Um, if you watch all the um, deleted scenes that are on the DVD, they are all character development. <laughs> so the sort of stuff uh, we, we writers complain about all the time in movies, right? Insufficient character development. Uh, I think you could still make an interesting movie, a jumper movie or t series, but it would definitely, I think, uh, have to be more of a, a little mini series, I think, instead of a feature film. Well, I mean, you actually wrote a whole novel detailing the character development for the character Griffin from the movie. Uh, tell us about that experience. Oh, that was good. Uh, it was interesting uh, because um, I had to send those chapters out to them to a... Exec one of the executive producers, a woman named Stacy Mays, a very nice woman, who would verify whether or not I was straying uh, or going in places that were explicitly uh, contradicted by the movie. Uh, I had seen all five scripts, so I knew roughly where they were going before they started filming, but then they started making decisions as they were going along. For instance, like partway into the very first scene with Jamie Bell, who can do a perfectly fine American accent. Um, and I've written like a third of the book at this point, right? With an American character, whose name is Griffin. Oh, no. <laughs> and, they, and, and, um, and Doug Lyman says, try that scene in your own accent. <laughs> And, which is this Northern England accent from like Leeds, you know, up near Scotland. And, um, and so he does. He says, why don't we go? We'll just go with that. So I had to change. Um, fortunately, I could make them, uh, Griffin's family expatriates. I, I didn't have to uproot them from where they were in San Diego <laughs> in the book. Oh, God. Um, God. but I had to turn them into expatriates and then, and then it, it did change the shape of the book. To a certain extent, but you know, just as I went forward, not a, not a big problem. I heard some great stories about the filming. Apparently, every time uh, Jamie Bell was in a scene with Hayden Christensen, Hayden's acting uh, rose a level as uh, the Griffin character was getting in the Davy character's face, and it just brought up the the stakes and the performance uh, apparently which was interesting i also heard of an interesting story about hayden christensen i know a lot of people don't like him or they think his acting is too wooden or whatever but this this sort of sold me on him uh at least as a person um doug lyman told this story in an interview and he said um i was you know interviewing all these hot young writers to for the part because I wasn't satisfied with the first guy they hired. Um, you mean you mean actors, right? Yeah. And um, and so when I was talking to Hayden Christensen, I said, "Okay, so what are you working on now?" And and all the other actors have been saying, "Oh, I'm working with this hot director on this project and this project." And Hayden Christensen just said, "Uh, I uh, rented a a bobcat and I'm gonna landscape my parents." yard <laughs> and uh 
And Lyman went, what, uh, what, you're not going to tell me about, you know, the movie projects you're working on right now? She says, oh, no, I really, I really want this part. Honest. I mean, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, say I don't, but uh, if you call, it's hard to hear the cell phone over the bobcat, so <laughs> you might have to call twice. <laughs> I thought that was funny. I mean, one line that Griffin had in the movie that kind of struck me was he says that the paladins have been hunting jumpers since the Middle Ages, I think. And it seems to me it would be very hard to hunt someone who can teleport instantaneously just with a horse and a sword. I don't know if that's something, did you think about that at all? Or is that something you, I don't know, dealt with at all uh, writing that, the, the Griffin storybook? Well, the, the point is, I think, and I think it's appropriate that regardless of the ability to jump away and go someplace else, um, people form associations and they form relationships. So you can track down people. Uh, it was not an actual script, but it was sort of a treatment thing that talked about the background of the paladins and so on. Maintained that uh, that Napoleon had a jumper working for him who would take orders to his various generals so that he was able to respond so much faster in all the battles. And this is one of the reasons for his uh, you know, domination of Europe. Hmm. That's interesting. Do you think you'll ever deal with uh, more of the history aspect of it in your mainline Jumper series? No. Um, no, I don't think so. Um, as far as, unless uh, for some reason we bring in another Jumper, um, which would be, uh, I mean, a Jumper or a his, some sort of record that shows that there have been Jumpers elsewhere. Um, Right now, I'm not particularly interested in that. I'm If I'm going to do anything, I might examine... I'm more curious about where the energy comes from for jumping, for tearing holes open between various areas. And if it comes from someplace, where is that? And what's happening there <laughs> where, the, where the energy is being taken from? I mean, there's one joke in... Uh, reflex where this they've brought in a physicist to try and figure out what's happening with jumping the bad guys have and he's interviewing Davy and he says something like so where does the energy come from he's, he says well every time I jump every cup of tea in the world drops <laughs> a fraction of a degree in temperature <laughs> and uh, He's just joking. I mean, but where does it come from? Uh, it would have to come from someplace. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, that that sort of scientific outlook is one of the things that makes these books so interesting. And in EXO, I, I just was blown away by how much scientific detail there was uh, in terms of the suit and, and other stuff that happens later in the book. Uh, how much research and or help did you have for this book? Well, I certainly did a lot of research, but the the suit itself has been um you know, the uh what we call what are called mechanical counterpressure suits. Um the first one of those was actually created and tested in the sixties by this guy, um this scientist who worked for NASA who literally is in a vacuum in a chamber and walks around for like 45 minutes doing all these incredible bends and uh, contortions that you cannot do in a traditional spacesuit. Uh, and it's, it's a suit that does not hold air, right? It's holding, it's reinforcing your skin. Your skin is perfectly capable of dealing with a vacuum if it has reinforcement. So if you can maintain just physical pressure against your skin uniformly, that's all you need. And it has some extreme advantages in that the biggest problem in being in space, in a space suit, or in space period, especially within the orbit of, say, the asteroid belt, is getting rid of heat. Keeping yourself from cooking in your own waste heat. And uh, when you have a uh, mechanical counterpressure suit, you can 
you can cool yourself just like you do on Earth by sweating. I mean, that's, that's they're, they're seriously examining this, uh, trying to work, uh, solve this particular problem, especially when they get to the point where they want to uh, put people on Mars because our current suits are just so heavy. Uh, even at a third of gravity, uh, they're going to make doing any sort of work on the planet very difficult. I mean, I mean, so obviously outer space stuff plays a huge role in this book, and there's certainly certainly stuff uh, toward the end of this book that suggests that uh, suggests a direction that future books might go in terms of even more outer space stuff. Is that something you're planning to pursue? I haven't. Um, yes, it is something I'm planning to pursue. The question is, what is the, you know, what is the story you tell there? And I have to think about that. Right now, I have these other books to do for Lightstorm. Um, these are the Avatar books? Yeah. Uh, Lightstorm is the um, is Cameron's production company. And and I want to write a the sequel to Seven Sigma, my metal little metal robots that eat all the metal in the American Southwest book. So then I'll probably come back at that point to Jumper. All right, cool. And then just one other thing I wanted to mention is that at the beginning of chapter 42 in this book, there's a mention of Wired Magazine. And since this podcast is on Wired.com, I was just curious. Uh, if you ha if you're a, Are you a Wired fan? How did you come to put that little reference in there? Um, well, it, it could go on many places. Wired is great uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, they are... Um, are in that area where technology is impacting our lives in a big way. Um, Cory Doctorow did a, a lovely review of this book that's going to be in Boing Boing. But the thing I loved about it in particular was his pointing out that one of the aspects of the book is the maker culture, the do-it-yourself aspects of uh, Synths and, and her allies as they as they're trying to do things to create a space program without the 16,000 employees that uh, NASA has. Well, yeah, and, and speaking of technology changing our lives, I did, we did have a question from JSL Adkins, wanted me to ask you about, you're the president of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, and he wanted me to ask you about how is CIFWA um, approaching the, the self-publishing, which is becoming a, a more and more important part of publishing? Right, well, our... My personal opinion on that is that writers write, professional writers get paid for what they write, and CIFWA has always used the amount of income a particular work has generated as part of the qualifications for whether or not you should be a, a member of this professional writers organization. So I think that if you're making more than our minimum advance in a reasonable period of time for a self-published work or for a work that is uh, a small press work where the combination of the advance you got from the small press plus the royalties you got within a reasonable period of time you know, are rising to the level of our current requirements, then I think they should be appropriate qualifications. We just, um, we are about to vote on putting, uh, actually, at the time this comes out, I'm sure we will have, have voted. In fact, I will say we have passed a vote on the board that says we will be putting the membership, you know, the question to the membership before November 1st, and when we do so, we will be putting up um, what we believe should be the qualifications for those memberships and um, and what changes we need to make to our bylaws to allow that. And then we will have the membership vote. Uh, currently, our responses um, from the membership as to whether or not they approve of self-publication or um, small press qualification are yes. Uh, at about three to one. 
I mean, is there anything else you want to say about Sifua generally or what's been going on or um, just any announcements you want to make? Anything like that? Uh, we're doing um, we're doing our best to make the organization get into this century. <laughs> we're um, we have um, some issues involving uh, attitudes that we have that I think are outdated that we have been uh, unduly supporting because of uh, our inclusion of those attitudes in our official publications. And we've done a lot to fix that. You know, I do like that we are being more inclusive, but the thing that I am absolutely adamant about is that I want to avoid behaviors and procedures and policies that are exclusive, that inappropriately exclude new members because of their gender, their race, their sexuality, their all sorts of, you know, the whole range of human behaviors. What should matter is are they writing professionally and they should not be made unwelcome by the sort of stuff that we put in our official avenues of uh, communication. Right. Actually, I mean, speaking of being more inclusive, there's a character in EXO named Corey Matoska, and there's kind of an interesting story about how he came to have that name. You want to talk about that? Sure. Corey Matoska is a uh, person, I believe, who lives in... Uh, he's a real person. He lives in um, Lubbock, I believe. But I offered a um a character be a character in my next book as a reward for a charity auction for something called Connor Bust, which is a a fund for that that works to help get more people of um uh, of color into science fiction conventions. Um so it helps, I mean, we are already seeing uh, lots of people of color in science fiction collections, but nowhere near in numbers that, that represent their, you know, their numbers in in the rest of our American society. So anyway, he uh, had the high bid, and he ended up uh, as uh, this scientist, engineer scientist in uh, in the book. And I was delighted, actually, because Corey is, of course, uh, also the first name of Corey Doctorow, who's a very good friend of mine. And uh, I, uh, you know, I, I sort of, as I said in the acknowledgments, I'm, I think of that character as uh, both a tribute to both of them. I also, um, I wanted to ask you about this. It says in your bio that, uh, that in 2012, you traveled to Qatar to talk about science fiction, uh, writing science fiction. Could you tell us about that? Right. So. Um, Qatar has something called Education City, which is a project of the current emir's mother, who was the previous emir's wife, uh, second wife, what they call the royal wife. She's called the royal wife because she's the mother of the heir to the throne. And she threw a lot of money at education in Cutter. They've got a so Education City is ten campuses of international schools, meaning schools from all over the world who have put a sub campus in this, you know, Education City in Doha that represents that usually covers then the thing they are best known for. But Texas A and M, uh, which is my alma mater has an engineering school there. And they brought me out to talk to students at Texas A&M in Education City at Doha. But I mean, what, what is the science fiction writing scene like in Qatar? I mean, are, 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 what, how much, how many, are there books and stuff being produced there? Or? You know, I don't know. <laughs> what I do know is it is science fiction. So Qatar is currently the richest country in the world per capita. Uh, because of this massive, massive uh, natural gas reservoir that is under there and a little bit under Iran. 
and they are throwing money at stuff. Uh, so you've got a thing called the West Bay, which is part of Doha, which did not exist 10 years ago, which has architecture that looks like it's out of the Jetsons. It's the most bizarre. I mean, it's, it's this incredibly futuristic architecture. And they are living in an environment where if it wasn't for energy, people would die. <laughs> they would die. They are desalinating their water. Um, they are, you know, they are air conditioning massively. It is an incredibly classist society. You have only 230,000 or so cuttery actual citizens, and you have over a million and a half people in the country where the other two million plus are employees, essentially. And it's just this amazing and weird kind of thing. Uh, 21st century architecture. But um, 30 years ago, or, well, possibly 50 years ago, this was a nation of, of nomadic camel razors and pearl divers. And that was the, the source of income. So do you think that that trip is going to inspire you to use that as a setting for fiction or inspire science fiction you write or anything like that? I think it will. Uh, if not the actual country, then this weird disparity of um, of wealth and and poor and rich and I mean that stuff's going to affect what I write. Well, yeah. And speaking of writing, I did want to put in a good word for the Viable Paradise Writers Workshop, which is actually where I first met you. Do you want to just say what's been what just a little bit about Viable Paradise and what's been going on with that lately? Sure. So Viable Paradise is on its is about to start its eighteenth year meaning uh, the 18th class of students uh, in the first week in October or the second week in October will go to Martha's Vineyard for a week of genre workshopping. It's, uh, I've been doing it since 2000. We have 24 students and uh, eight instructors, actually a few more guest instructors this year than that. But uh, people who will be teaching there are... Uh, myself, uh, Laura will be there briefly to do a lecture. That's your. I'm oh, sorry, wife, Laura, Laura Mixon. Mixon, Laura J. Mixon, my wife, who has been a full instructor in previous years. But uh, um, Elizabeth Bear, Scott Lynch, Sherwood Smith, Stephen Bruce, and then uh, Patrick and Teresa Nielsen Hayden will be there have been there since the second one. And the instructors who have been there back from the very first one are uh, Jim McDonald and Deborah Doyle. Uh, but we're a workshop that tries to um, give you a meaningful you know, workshop experience with both um, workshopping and lectures for people who can't do six weeks, uh, take six weeks out of their lives. And go to Clarion, Clarion West, or Odyssey. Is Odyssey a six week? It is, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I definitely would recommend Viable Paradise, just as Steve says, for people who just want to, you know, give it a try and don't want to commit to a gigantic six week long workshop. I, I endorse it. It's on Martha's Vineyard. It's beautiful. Uh, you know, everyone should go check it out. Um, Steve, I did want to ask you well, about one other thing in your bio. It says that you uh, keep chickens and study Aikido. And in an interview, I heard you say that you chose or that you like Aikido because it's a martial art where you can defend yourself without hurting your opponent. And the example you gave is that, like if a, if a fight breaks out at Thanksgiving dinner. And I just thought that was a very interesting example of when you might want to use Aikido. <laughs> well, I think you could use it at any point, but I think... But just the fact that that's what came to mind for you <laughs> then, was Thanksgiving dinner. Well, I've I heard it from someone else. It's someone you can use on a drunken uncle without getting kicked out of the family, uh -huh. right? <laughs> uh, but the main thing about it to me is that it's also something that I won't hesitate to use, because if it 
if my response is to kill or maim someone, I'm probably going to hesitate. But because I have a whole set of techniques that I can use to control someone or to project them away from me without necessarily hurting them, I don't have the hesitation that I would have in hitting someone in the throat uh, or, you know, hitting someone in a place that's going to really mess them up. Which isn't to say you can't kill someone with these techniques. It's just you have the choice. Uh, if you throw someone or you... There's a technique called Ikkyo, which is just a elbow control technique that you take the person down to the ground, sometimes in a spiral, and you end up with them on, you know, face down while you're pinning them. Um, if you choose instead on the way down to run their head into a wall, <laughs> you still have that option. <laughs> and it's going to be not good for them. How about the keeping chickens? How did that, where that, how did that come about? Oh, it was an accidental thing. You know, like happens. <laughs> <laughs> We're, um, so I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, I am in the city limits of Albuquerque. But um, there are people who keep chickens. And this feral chicken started hanging out in this big cedar bush in our front yard. And then this rooster who who actually lives at a different with a different house started paying conjugal visits to this chicken. And it was the most pathetic rooster when it, it would crow, but it really sounded like someone just clearing their voice. It was like <laughs> like excuse me <laughs> um and uh but then uh one monday after easter uh the black chicken walked out with six chicks trailing behind it out of under that bush and we made a um uh, chicken place in the back and we've had chickens ever since i'm not going to get into the great dog massacre of 2009 <laughs> that was just too awful well i guess that's part of the fun in living in albuquerque new mexico i, I that new mexico has always kind of had this sort of magical feel to me because that's where Roger Zelazny lived and where George R. R. Martin lives and it just seems to have all these great science fiction authors. Are you part of that community of science fiction authors in there in New Mexico? Uh, I certainly know everybody. Um, unfortunately, Roger was scheduled to come to a patio warming at our house the day he went into the hospital for the last time. Um, so yeah, uh, and Roger was. Had you, I mean, had you known him prior to that? I'd known him at conventions, and Laura uh -huh. had known him much longer. Since so she's from New Mexico, uh, I ended up here because of Laura. Uh, but um, but yeah, we we do. Uh, we got to go up to George's theater, the Cocteau, and see um, the premiere of uh, season four of Game of Thrones with the character Javier whatever the character it was a new character showing up it was the I actually don't watch uh, Pedro was it Pedro Pascal Pedro Pascal exactly yeah. he was uh, he was actually there at the showing and stuff it was great oh, cool. it was very nice so when you say George's theater you mean like a theater he owns or a theater in his house or no you don't know about the Cocteau so I'm afraid I'm afraid I, I don't think I okay, do okay so the Cocteau was a um, art house theater for years in Santa Fe, and when George first moved here, he would watch all the movies. That's where he would go to see movies. Uh, this was back long before he was even his first trips to Hollywood. And it, he had very fondness, great fondness for it. And it it went out of business a long time ago, and there were a couple of attempts to revive it, including some an attempt to um, turn it into a film a museum, history of film museum which didn't, 
last long and then it went up for sale again and uh, around th three years ago and george said someone should buy that someone and fix it up <laughs> someone with money oh oh <laughs> I'll buy that. And he bought it and, and it's been working as a uh, working theater and an art venue in the gallery. And Ty Frank's wife uh, designed the counter in there. And it's, it's a great little theater, but he does special events there. And occasionally when sufficiently drawing authors come through town, they do readings and signings there as well. Yeah, that sounds that sounds amazing. I, I've always meant to make a pilgrimage to to Santa Fe, where Rogers Lozny lives someday. So maybe uh, maybe when I do that, I'll I'll swing by the the cocktail as well. Right. One of the things I most regret as president of Sifwa is that I am not allowed to make a grandmaster who is deceased, because Roger, without a doubt, is someone who died before he could be made. Grandmaster, but deserved it totally for his body of work. Absolutely, yeah. All right, well, Steve, uh, this has been a pretty long conversation, so we should, we should probably start wrapping this up. Do you have any uh, any other projects you want to mention? Any final thoughts? Anything like that? Nope, nope. I'm gonna be at I'm gonna be in New York for the um, Sifla reception on October sixth. But uh, if anyone's there, I'll see you. All right, great. So we've been speaking with Stephen Gould, and his new book is called EXO. So, Steve, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. And that was our interview. So thanks again to Stephen Gould for being our guest today. And for our panel, we'll be discussing the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And this will involve spoilers for all the Ninja Turtles movies, including the one that just came out. So just be aware of that. And like Leonardo, I'm joined today by three teammates. So first up, we've got Matt London, making his 12th appearance on the show. He's the author of The Eighth Continent, an eco-adventure sci-fi novel which comes out on September 16th. He's also the creator of the web series Space Pirates in Space, and author of the Nickelodeon book Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mad Libs. So Matt, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Then next up, we've got Allison Hayslip, who you may remember from our panel on the Nintendo Entertainment System back in episode 114. She's an actress and TV personality who's appeared on G4, The Voice on NBC, The Nerdist and The Nerd Machine, as well as in various film and TV projects including Battleground, Saturn Returns, Video Games the Movie, and the Team Unicorn Saturday Action Fun Hour. So Allison, thanks for joining us. Cowabunga, dudes! <laughs> and also joining us today for the very first time is writer and director David Wexler. He's the creator and producer of MTV's reality show College Life, and he wrote and directed the feature films Evil Weed and The Stand-Up, as well as the upcoming movies Anchors and Turtle Island. So, David, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to do is just go around and have everyone talk a little bit about how big of a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle fan are you, and are you most familiar with the cartoon, video games, movies, that sort of stuff? So I'll just say, I, as I've said before, I was a huge Saturday morning cartoon fan growing up. And so I was definitely first introduced to the Turtles through the Saturday morning cartoon. And I spent a lot of my childhood drawing Teenage Mutant, drawing, you know, doodling Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in class. And then I was also a huge, huge fan of the first feature film that came out, I think in about 1990, uh, the live action one. I, I watched that probably dozens of times. And uh, and so those are definitely my that's that's sort of where my teenage mutant ninja turtle fandom centers. Uh, how about Allison? What uh, tell us about your teenage mutant? Ninja <laughs> I can't even say it. teenage mutant ninja turtle uh, fandom. Uh, well, mine is very similar to yours. I definitely watched the uh, you say Saturday morning cartoon, but I think it was on every day for a while. Um, yeah, I, I yeah no, it was because I watched it every day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I definitely watched that religiously. Um, I was also obsessed with the arcade game, the side scrolling arcade game. There was a there was a Pizza Hut that was like probably a half hour from where I lived growing up and my brother and I used to beg my parents to bring us there every weekend so we could play the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game there. Um and then, you know, I've seen I've seen all the movies. I think the only thing I haven't done is read the comics. Well, it's funny you mentioned Pizza Hut cuz uh 
because obviously the turtles are big fans of pizza. And on fa- on our Facebook page, William Ryan says, "I love the old TMNT promotion that Pizza Hut did." Does anyone remember Pizza Hut doing doing a Teenage no, Mutant Ninja I, Turtles I know they, crossover? They did it in the new movie, though, right? They sponsored it, but I, I don't remember the first one. I, yeah, I don't remember that either. But that this sounds vaguely fitting. <laughs> Vaguely familiar to me, but I don't remember the specifics. Tell us, Dave. Tell no, us. No, no, I don't. No, no, no. This was someone. She was actually asking this. us. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was a legitimate, non-rhetorical question. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, if nobody knows, uh, how about uh, David? Tell us about your. Uh, what do you What do you like about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Well, I was like five at the time when it came out. So, in a crazy way, it's like my first. My first real memories are all Ninja Turtle memories. Um, and in the new Turtle Power documentary, which is really cool, uh, they talk about it was it was just such a brilliant marketing campaign that they kind of had you know the video games hit when the animated series hit, the toys hit, it kind of like all hit and just took over. So I mean, I loved the cartoon as well, clearly, but it was more than that. It was it was like the bed sheets, the lunch boxes. It was kind of just this mass thing. Wait, did you have turtle bed sheets or oh, oh, lunch yeah. boxes? That kind oh, of stuff? absolutely. I mean, we we all did. So yeah, it was kind of all at the same time. So, do, what other uh, paraphernalia did you have? Did you, like, was there anything even more like extreme than that? Yeah, I mean, we had. Uh, what was cool about the Halloween costumes was that they had. It was just like the armbands and the the knee pads, and then the um. And then like the nose face mask thing, but it, it was kind of real, you know, it was like, you didn't have to wear the nose thing. You could kind of just be like a skateboarding ninja and like put the, put, <laughs> put, put the knee pads over like the rollerblade pads, you know what I mean? So it was kind of official. And then, you know, growing up in New York, um, and, and skating around the, the manholes, it, it really felt like we were Ninja Turtles. I mean, it was really, it was very strange, but, um, I, you know, I would wear that stuff to school, uh, trying to think of what else was really crazy um no i think the bed sheets was, was, was as far as i really well wait so when you went. dressed up for halloween which turtle did you dress up as i think i was like you know like Raphael was kind of like uh Raphael was my favorite um so you're totally I, a Raphael. i think <laughs> <laughs> i think i was always um i'm cool but rude right that's what they say Actually, yeah. I, was, I was just i was just uh watching the tv show and it was so weird how it just like brought back all these old memories. But I was watching the first episode of the show. And you know when you used to sing along to to things, like obviously I knew every word except one word. And it was the cool but rude thing. And I never knew what they said. And I would always put in different words. But I finally got it. <laughs> I think it's cool but rude. I finally yeah. figured that out. That's um, definitely it. Yeah. <laughs> well, wait. So because that's funny because if you're Raphael, I totally – I would identify with Leonardo. And well, I, I'm Allison Michelangelo. totally strikes me as a Michelangelo. Oh, exactly. Yeah. So, so like, Matt, Matt you're are stuck. you Donatello? You, you can, we can have all four if you, if you, you know, this is just like when I would play the arcade game with my brother and his friends, they would always make me be Donatello because <laughs> it was the least popular one. So no, once again, Donatello once was again, the best in the arcade game because his, uh, his staff kept them so far away. Like he got to stay out of harm's way because his weapon was so long. He had the best reach with the bow yeah. staff. That's true. That's a technique yep. that they actually use in a lot of the the turtles games. So yeah. there is a they had to sweeten the deal for <laughs> yeah. got stuck playing Donatello. Um, I'll take it. Sure, <laughs> I'm a nerd. All right, so that 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 works out perfectly. But Matt, I mean, in your email to me, you you described yourself, I think, as the biggest turtles fan i've ever seen. Something like that. Well, it's funny. I, yeah, I, I wonder if every kid kind of feels that way. Because already just listening to people talk about their experiences, it's like, oh, yeah, the Pizza Huts all had the arcade game. And, oh, my gosh, I just remembered that face mask where they they would give you a band like the Halloween costume had a bandana. And so you tie it on. But then it had like a like a protrusion dangling from the thing. So it was like just the green nose. Right. <laughs> it was the <laughs> weirdest. Like thing. It was like an old like top. Groucho glasses kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. um, but turtle nose. Um, so these are things that I'm remembering now just talking about it. But, um, yeah, I was really obsessed. Like I had pretty, I I was like that stereotypical kid who would watch an episode of the show and go, I need a truck that shoots pizzas out the front (laughs) like Frisbees. I need this immediately. And so pretty much multiple years worth of allowance went exclusively to Ninja Turtles action figures and associated vehicles. (laughs) Um, so, I, I mean, I was really into it. I watched the show as much as I could. I had the first six or seven episodes on, on VHS, which I think had been part of a promotional thing with some other fast food or fast casual restaurant. 
Um, so I would watch those just over and over and over again. Um, and then, you know, each movie, uh, was like a religious experience, you know, going on the <laughs> pilgrimage to the theater. And, um, and, and then the games, of course, you know, uh, even from that first sort of infamous Nintendo, uh, console game all the way through like the Super Nintendo Sega Genesis era, every game that came out, I was like that the day it was out, I had to get it. And that was the, that was the hardest one. I mean, that console game, the first NES game was, was a nightmare because it was like, it, it, I was so excited that I could finally play this game and it just ruined your life. Because I mean, like, I don't yeah. even think I made it past the first level. No, it classic Nintendo hard. I mean, and the other weird thing about that game is that like nothing in it except the characters of the turtles themselves have anything to do with the like Ninja Turtles. You're like fighting flying robot bugs yeah. and there are these giant steamrollers that are trying to kill you doesn't make any sense at all but um yeah it was just like it was an incredibly challenging game some of the levels were just near impossible and um you know i've gone back and tried to play through it i still can't beat that game yeah i mean i i thought i had forgotten that but i went and watched a let's play of it and i remembered there's this part where you have to swim underwater and disarm these bombs right and it just yeah. brought back all these horrible memories of how i think it's like level two or something yeah. i never could make it past that well, it's that what happens is this, it'll, whenever you get zapped by electricity under the water, it freezes and it, your, your TV makes the harshest, most unbearable <laughs> noise you can imagine. Oh, yes. And you'd get stuck. And so it would just do it over and over and over again. It's games like that that remind me that we were much better gamers back then than we are now. Like there yeah, was a well, skill to making it through games at the end when you didn't have save points like we do now. Right. There, I remember the menu would get like, Whoever was helping you on that mission, whether it's April or Splinter or someone, would give you hints. But the hint would always be like, yeah, you should disarm these bombs quickly. It's like, oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for your help. Appreciate it. Or like, there's one where I remember if you, uh, we finally beat that second level. We, my brother and I would like, you know, alternate lives and levels in, in Nintendo. And so we finally beat that underwater bomb defusal mission. And then it opens. It's like, now you're in the streets of New York. And we were so excited. So we push pause to look at the <laughs> map. And it is this rat maze, this gigantic mess of white squiggly lines. No way to tell where you are, or where you're going. There is no reprieve in that game. It's just punishment after punishment. Yeah. Well, how about the the, the four-play arcade uh, Allison mentioned? That was, I remember that being a lot of fun. And that not, was my not favorite. And not unfairly hard either. No. Multiple... Multiple years, I had birthday parties at the local arcade, and each time, I would always insist that like my friends would would team up with me and and play all you know all four players on that arcade game so that we could you know power our way through the whole thing. It's cool that ge that game is awesome, and the graphics were like amazing in, in, yeah. in that game. It was, it was kind of like when Virtua Fighter came out. It was just like so ahead of its time. Those graphics it was amazing. Well, and and it was so smartly made for like younger kids to be able to play because you could get far in that game just by constantly hitting the attack button and pushing forward. Cause, and like, it's if you're... quarters. Yes, in quarters, obviously. <laughs> um, but like, like I was saying with Donatello, like if you just kept whipping Donatello's bow staff back and forth, no one was getting near you. You could make it through half the game just doing that. <laughs> Someone was telling me there's an optimal number of turtles to play that game with. Having to do with the difficulty curve, like it's yeah, not it's four. four. It's four because yeah. well, <laughs> so one one player is a certain difficulty level. Two increases in difficulty. Three increases more, and four then goes back to the difficulty of two to kind of oh. reward you for having all four there. This is a factoid. I don't know why I know it, but I know it, and I'm a little embarrassed. <laughs> yeah. Well, Matt mentioned the action figures. Uh, how about Allison and David? Did you guys? Uh, collect the action figures as well. Oh, hells yeah! I mean, I have. I literally. I'm mean, embarrassed to say this. I have about forty of them under my bed as we speak. I mean, <laughs> in, in, in pretty in pretty good condition because they were like they were substantial. You know, you can knock those around. They, they were unbelievable. Yeah, they were they were durable. Very durable. They were, they were short and stocky. And what was so cool is that they were like the size of a GI Joe, but yeah, like you said, stocky, but. It, it, they they were all different colored, which was interesting because right right like the TV show and the movies I think all the turtles were the same color, but here to differentiate them, yeah, their um, skin color was their different. Skin they tone were, was a little different. Yeah. It was very interesting. It made them kind of look very very different. Yeah, I mean there was interesting stuff about that in the Turtle Power documentary you mentioned because 
Um, it was there were all these villains they mentioned that I'd never heard of. I mean, just dozens and dozens of monsters. It just seemed like for a while, anything somebody at the toy company drew on a piece of paper, they'd make a toy out of it and <laughs> put it in a box. Yeah. Well, I think they, you know, they they were trying to make enemies out of regular people around New York, but then you realize like who really wants to see turtles defeat a fireman? Like you want to root for the fireman. So they would have to make them like also affected by the ooze and the sludge and all that. So they became these like mutant people who well, did like, weird yeah. things. It was basically anything anthropomorphic, right? I mean, it was like, yeah. it was like, you know, yeah. Sewer face man or what? I mean, they just got crazy with it, but then they started going back and putting them in the cartoons. Like I remember I had a guy named uh, rat King. And, like, Rat King then became a villain in the TV show. But, th- but they did that really well, again, like, where they would tie all these different worlds in. I, I really haven't – I still haven't seen anything like that, I don't think, since. Well, I think it's interesting, you know, to talk about the documentary. Um, they decided to make the action figures first and then made the cartoon to sell the action figures. And I don't know of any other um, property that's done it in that order. You know, like I think cartoons hit hit it off and then they're like, oh, let's make let's make action figures out of them. But Turtles, I think, is the only one where they were like, we need to make action figures, but we need kids to want these action figures. So let's make a cartoon. So they very easily like made up all these action figures and then threw them into the cartoon somehow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that given the age we all are, we were basically introduced to Turtles by the cartoon or something around that time. But there was the comic that came first. And I never actually saw the comic at all. But friends, I had some sort of hipster friends who would be like, oh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is so mainstream now. Like it used to be just this cool, edgy indie comic. And um, I don't just but did you, any, any of you guys ever actually seen the, the comic book? Yeah, I have it. Uh, it's funny. I It was one of those things where I think... The first couple of trades got re-released um, in the early 90s when the movies were coming out. Um, and I, so I picked it up then thinking it was just comics. And I was struck by how tonally different it was. And what, what, you know, what irritated me the most was that all four of them had red headbands. Yeah. So you couldn't yeah. really tell them apart. Yeah. I mean, I don't know why that upset me so much. <laughs> I was like, it's not right. But of course, you know, originally that was how it was done. And um, it's, you know, what's interesting is that the story of the comics does keep to, you know, borrows, a, well, the movie borrows a lot from the original comics, um, which I think is actually kind of interesting when you, when you watch it again. Um, and then the comics themselves, they're, they're very dark and violent. Um, they, they're much more, you know, much more accent on the ninja, whereas the, uh, the cartoon was much more accent on the teenage, I think. <laughs> So are they always holding weapons so you can tell them apart? They sometimes have weapons. I think sometimes they... I don't think there's even like a... Uh, Did it have a letter on the belt? No. I don't rem- I, that I don't remember. But I, don't, I, don't I also think, so, think that yeah. they're, they're not as partial... They're not as like particular about who's using what weapon at any given time. So it's like... It's much more flexible. Um, I don't know why they decided to make it more rigid when they turned it into a series. Although, you know, I can guess... Um, but yeah, the comic is, it's dark and weird. The monsters are a lot scarier. Um, I think April's role is much more mature and interesting than it is in the cartoon. Um, well, sh- cool. don't they kill Shredder in the first yeah, issue? Yeah, it's early. Yeah. So it's like, it's, it's very different. Um, and much more, I think it's, I don't know, it, you know, it was, it was the eighties and it kind of feels like one of those darker kind of edgier comics from that era. Well, it feels like a Frank Miller comic, kind of. Yeah, a, a lot like that. And I know that there's, like, some... Um, there was a connection between Eastman and Laird and Frank Miller that I know Eastman and Laird were big fans of Daredevil. There's a lot of, like, Daredevil Easter eggs in the um, in the comic. The biggest one being, you know, the Hand and the Foot Clan. So it's like, there are all of these connections. What's cool, though, with, like, Miller and, like, even, even Watchmen or... Um... And I've seen the first comic since, but I was older when I when I came across it. Um, but even the original TV show, New York, right? It always kind of looked the same um, in all of those things. Like if you just see the backgrounds in like the Turtles show, it actually kind of looks like the Watchmen backgrounds. It was like this very neon-y, you know, crime was, I think, much, you know, hot, like, you know, at, at a very high rate back then. But it, it's weird that that background of New York feels very similar in all of those comics. 
And it was kind of, right, and like all these vigilante comics were coming out right around that time. I wonder what the correlation was. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, Matt mentioned which uh, weapons the different turtles have, and did anyone else feel that Raphael really got the short end of the stick on that one? Like as a kid, <laughs> I always thought that his weapon just seemed so much less effectual than all the other turtles' weapons. That's funny. I actually thought Leonardo always got the short end of the stick because he, like, his was boring compared to the other three you know i was like oh he has swords whatever i remember a, the sigh was hard to say when i was younger for, some, yeah. for, whatever, yeah. for whatever reason i never really knew what it was the sighs were cool though you could like block sword attacks and stuff with it yeah You'd stab mousers in the head shake them around i i don't know i like i like the size Raphael. you know Raphael's such a good fighter he doesn't need full-length swords he can just handle it with the size yeah i always wondered if you know if that was why he was so angry because he got the crummy weapon or if he just <laughs> had to be so hyper aggressive to compensate for his lack of range right you know i also you know it's funny Raphael. i think has is the character of the four of them that's gotten the most sort of like character maintenance from iteration to iteration that like in the in the movie, he's very in the in the original film, he's very uh like he's the grumpy one, the rough he's the Wolverine of the group. Yes. Whereas like in the cartoon, he's more like Matthew Perry on Friends. <laughs> just like always kind of like making snarky comments. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well yeah, David, I mean you're you're our resident Raphael here, right? What do you what do you think about that? No, I think that's spot on. That's very funny. Um and uh, yeah, I mean I saw the the newest the newest film too. He was super, super aggressive. I think that's one of my favorite parts in the new film when he kind of, uh, he's becoming nice as they all think that they're going to kind of wind up dead at the end. That's a funny kind of bit. But yeah, um, I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think he has the, the biggest tonal shifts. I think Michelangelo's is always the, the kind of, he's steady, right? I mean, his, his, his yeah. is always, he's always the same kind of guy. Uh, I love Raphael's voice though in the first, uh, in the first series, it was it was a fun kind of little snarkyish voice, um, but then I I noticed it get much darker, you know, as the years passed. Yeah, they do a good job of making him feel like the outcast in the new movie, the one who just doesn't quite fit in. Actually, okay, before we get to the new movie, maybe we should uh, like go through the different movies that have come out and say what we think of them. So I already said I was a like a totally obsessed with the 1990 version. Um, were were you guys similarly obsessed with that movie? Oh yes, oh yeah. I mean, I even like the second one, even though people give it a lot of flack. But I remember my grandmother taking me to the movies to see that second one, and uh, and and Vanilla Ice Man. How do you not like that? <laughs> Was that Go Ninja Go Ninja Go? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> there there were actually a lot of things in the second one that I liked too. Um, you know, one of the things that I walked out of the first one being disappointed in as a kid was like, you know, I was expecting the show. I wanted giant mutant monster fights. Um, and the fact that, you know, Rocksteady and Bebop were omitted from the first film was like mm. a great injustice for me. And although they were also omitted from the second film, I found it a little bit more acceptable that they did manage to squeeze in some, you know, evil mutants. And of course, that super shredder fight at the end, uh, Vanilla Ice notwithstanding, what I think is one of the best sequences in, in both movies. Um, that's an awesome fight scene. Which uh, movie is, is Casey Jones in? Because I think Casey Jones deserves a couple minutes here. Yeah, he's in the that's, first one. He's in the first one. I think he actually, I think he appears in all of them in, in a smaller capacity. But the first movie is the one where he has that great scene at the beginning in the where park, he fights right? Raphael and stuff. Oh, the yeah. And they're like one up against yeah, each other. Right. That's great. I mean, he's such a. I was watching the cartoon the other day uh, just to kind of go back and revisit it, but it's so funny because um, I don't know if you guys have seen it recently, but they do a Clint Eastwood impersonation. It's like it's so it's so Clint Eastwood, and there are all these like little Clint Eastwood jokes in it. Like uh, Raphael's like, oh, he's just like a character from the Filthy Harry movies, but you got to see it. It's like instead of Dirty Harry, you know, they uh, it's crazy that like Casey Jones went from it was just a complete Clint Eastwood kind of rip off. Well, that, that's another thing that they touch on in the documentary, that they made Casey Jones just, like, a dude who watched too many movies and decided he wanted to be a vigilante. Like, he doesn't have any other backstory besides that. It's not like someone killed his parents in front of him or, like, you know, he got he got bit by a radioactive spider. It's just, like, he watched a lot of movies and was like, I want to do this. <laughs> and, and his weapons are just, like, kind of hanging around the apartment, right? Just, like, you, yeah. em empty out the golf bag and, like, whatever's there. Like, just a toaster, like a baseball bat. Just fill it up. 
So wait, did you go back and watch the cartoon in preparation for this panel or just for some other reason? No, I mean, I, mean, kind, I mean, kind of in preparation, but, you know, I, I had I had seen the, the movie, which, you know, the new, when it was recently, like the, a week ago, the one that just came out. And a lot of people, you know, I heard a lot of different things from different people about it. So I, I was just in, in the mood, um, but then to prep a little bit. But um, it was weird to see it because it kind of just washes right back over you like... Um, even when we were just talking about the video game and turning off the things underwater, like it's so weird when you hear those, like you could kind of feel exactly how you felt, you know, when you're watching that the yeah. first time. Um, you remember, you remember all the quotes and also the, like the way that each quote's inflected, every syllable is kind of like still in your head in, in a weird way. <laughs> yeah. It, it's bizarre. Yeah. Has anyone else tried to go back and watch any of the old cartoon movie stuff? And was it different than you remember? I haven't, but I want to now. It was weird. You know, when I watched the, the TMNT movie that came out, and I think it was 2007, the, the computer-generated one, uh, I walked out of that one, and I was like, wow, I don't remember Raphael being that much of a dick. And, <laughs> and my friends were like, no, he was. So I don't know. I, I, that's why I'd be curious to go back and watch the older stuff and see if I think Raphael was that much of a dick, because I, I definitely don't remember him being that much of a dick in the older I stuff. Just I always had such a crush on Michelangelo, and I, I wonder if I went back and watched them, if I'd still be, like, that attracted to a turtle. <laughs> um, I think that the, the you know, what's in, what I actually like about that 2007 movie is that it was sort of done in the continuity of the live-action films. And so I, I think if you went back and watched the original, the, the original live-action films, you would see that sort of dickishness that, that Raphael has. However... Um, I think the cartoon, he's, you know, much softer. Um, in that, I don't know, in that original series, uh, I watched a bit of it, uh, not too long ago, sort of while I was working on the book. And, um, I was struck by how, um, how the pacing of children's television has changed, um, in, in 25 years. So it's kind of amazing, actually, like, uh, how slow it is to get started. Uh, how it sort of drags out the story over several episodes. And then uh, how weird the world is. I mean, every character kind of has some sort of grotesque element to them. And there's like grandmothers on the street with uh, automatic weapons in their shopping carts. It's just like this strange stuff that kind of gets tucked into the, sh into the show. I totally agree. The The pacing was really interesting. Like, like the first episode is like, it's really good. Like, I, I mean, it almost felt Tarantino-esque in like uh, the flashback story. It's like we're thrown in this world. The turtles aren't revealed for a few minutes. And then, it, you know, the picture 30 years ago, we have no idea what this whole show is. We're watching it for the first time. It's like right at the point where you're like, what is going on? Then they go to the flashbacks and it begins in, you know, and, and you see... Uh, the whole story with the ooze and everything like that. I mean, that, it, it really, it was very interesting. Like the, the credit that they gave young kids at that time, you know, to, to stick with it and understand. I mean, it was, it was, it was confusing. Um, but somehow I guess it, it, it worked. Uh, so uh, it was a major feature of this new movie that Michelangelo is kind of creeping on April O'Neil. Is that, I don't remember that from the, I remember them kind of having a crush on April, maybe, but I don't remember it being creepy. If I went back and watched it, would I find it creepy, or was that a? He was definitely his... always the flirtier one. I think I don't think it was as blatant as they do in the new movie, but he was definitely like he was. He was more of the charmer, if I remember correctly, <laughs> as the one who had a crush on him. Right, you might. Be I remember that him. Up. Yeah, maybe maybe that's just how I, I I want to remember him being, but I I. I I don't remember it being as blatant as it was in this movie. It was a lot in this movie. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, speaking of crushes, uh, William Ryan on Facebook also noted that lots of boys had crushes on April O'Neil, that she was a uh, sort of a major uh, what, like sex icon for eight-year-old boys or whatever in the early 80s. Yeah, totally. I always saw her as kind of a... Um as a big sister character in a way. I mean, they say weird stuff to her in the cartoon, but I don't remember the specifics. They almost treat her like a younger sister in the original films. And then, um, you know, what I found interesting about this, the sort of the retelling of the origin in the, in the new movie was that, um, she's very much a, a, an older sister to them, which makes yeah. Michelangelo's behavior, I guess, a little bit weirder. <laughs> Maybe that's why it's so creepy. 
What's cool yeah. is uh, in the, in the in the animated series, the turtles are significantly shorter than she is, and then now in the new movie, right. they're much they're bigger, huge, which is really yeah. weird. Well, and in the movies too, the original movies, they were shorter. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I understand the decision to make them as big as they did in this new movie. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that because yeah, in the in the older movies, they're kind of like cute. You know, they're kind of like cute and fun and. Yeah, yeah, like teenagers you hang out with. And yeah, and in this new movie, I mean, Raphael looks like he could rip the head off of Buffalo. You know, I mean, he's <laughs> yeah. so freaking big and scary looking. And yeah, it, it, to my mind, it just totally changes the whole character of the show. Yeah, and I was trying to sit there and picture like, what would these four guys look like if they were human? You know, I mean, if they're still teenagers, they're no more than 18 or 19, right? And how could they be that jacked? It's like they're all played by Taylor Lautner or something like that. <laughs> um, all right, I guess before we get too much into the newest movie, does anyone have any rea- anything they want to say about Turtles in Time or or TMNT, uh, T- the 2007 movie? Or any- what, isn't there a Nickelodeon cartoon, too, that's yeah, I'll talk about- the... Uh... So I'll talk about the show a lot, but uh, quickly I'll, I'll mention... Um... Turtle and t- Turtles in Time. Turtles in Time was awesome. It was sort of like the the arcade follow up to that original, the four player sort of beat 'em up arcade game. Yeah, and um, it was awesome because you got to like see foot soldiers and cowboy hats, and you got to fight prehistoric turtles, and you got to go to the far future where Krang is floating around in a UFO and turning you into a tiny turtle. There's like all sorts of weird stuff. There were hoverboards, um, and it's just such a great format that I think a lot of games are missing today that, you know, four player cooperative, um, you know, sort of you against the machine thing and not have it be a first person game like, you know, every other game. Right. See, man, I was actually talking about the third the movie. live action movie. Wasn't oh, it called Turtles? Wasn't so, it called Turtles in Time? Turtles in Time, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's crazy because there's a, there is an arcade game called Turtles in Time, which is... Uh, different from the the third movie right the third movie is the one where they the go back travel to back japan in. yeah 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 high foot that was the line i remember from that one oh they that's right high foot <laughs> <laughs> i actually never saw that one is is, is, is <gasps> it it's good what no, no of course it's not good <laughs> okay. but it doesn't matter so it's better than the sequel though right it wasn't better than uh i, I saw those two i haven't seen in years when, yeah. since i was a kid but i think i, I think better than than two because I think Turtles in Time tried to go back to the real grittiness of the first movie. You know, they, they realized, because I learned this in the documentary as well, but like, you know, the first movie was so successful that they got the second movie out in a year, which is insane for the late 80s, early 90s or whenever that came out. Like movies these days barely come out in a year, you know? So they just obviously piecemealed that second movie together and then i think they were like okay wait a minute let's actually work on a script for the third one (laughs) um so is it is it great no is it better than the second one yeah probably (laughs) well because i I looked those movies up on rotten tomatoes and the first movie is 40 percent, and i was like what 40 percent? come on i love that movie so yeah i i I guess i'm I'm asking more compared to the other movies is it good you know like how how does it rate compared to the first movie which i absolutely loved I don't think I've seen it so, or, like recently enough yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. say that kind of comparison. I mean, the thing is, is like there's so many movies I watched as a kid as a kid that are terrible, but I love them because it involved, you know, the properties that I loved. So, I, Turtles in Time will always have a place in my heart. All right, cool. And uh, 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 Allison or David, did you see the TMNT 2007 movie? Do you have any thoughts about that one? I did. I, 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 oh, sorry, Allison. No, I was just going to say, I, I completely forgot ex- it existed. I didn't <laughs> see it. <laughs> I saw it when it came out, um, so I don't remember it that well. I remember it, you know, I've seen, and I've seen the new, what is it, the new Nickelodeon show, the style of them. I, I guess that was kind of the halfway point, right? The TMNT uh, 2007 between like the old classic and kind of where we are now and how they looked, right? It almost, they started looking less and less specific, right? It, it, with the animation. Um, I remember that being a little bit of 
bit bit difficult to say. Wait, what, what do you mean by less specific? It's like, well, right, the new Nickelodeon show, it's kind of very little detail in just how they're drawn. It's like very... Sort of minimalist? Yeah, kind of? minimalist. That's that's exactly what I'm looking for. And I feel like the TMNT, even though obviously the graphics were better because we've advanced with computers, I don't know, it just didn't have that same heart. It looked like it was la- it was lacking something. I remember the, the art kind of threw me off, I remember. Um, and no one feels that way? No, absolutely. I mean, I think because we grew up seeing our turtles one way, when you manipulate that at all, it just kind of screws with our our uh, sentimentality towards them, you know? I mean, maybe maybe the kids these days like the way they're they're looking, but, you know, it's weird to me. I think some someone was talking about, I, I don't know if we touched on this earlier, what I loved about, I think, successful cartoons, whether it's Bart Simpson or the Turtles, I think it's it's how easy are they to draw when you're a kid. And I think that was really fun with the Turtles. Um, again, I, I don't know if it was just the heart or whatever was put into that original series. I could, I could draw it now, you know, and, and have it kind of look and feel similar. I don't, it was just something about the proportions, the, you know, the kind of slightly googly eyed look to them. And it, it just, those, like Allison said, I think those were the Turtles we grew up with. So of course, any cartoon specifically is going to be very, I think, difficult for an old fan to kind of get behind. One of the things that I really appreciated about that, the 07 animated movie, was that um, I think that it really got to the heart of what the what the conflict is between the turtles. Like the, what, the, the one of the things that stands out to me across the board um, for the for the property as a whole is how distinct each of the four of them are in personality. They may all look the same and just have their bandanas to tell them apart, but they have strikingly different personalities. And what the 07 movie did was it sort of, it really captured the tension between Leonardo and Raphael as this point of drama um, in how they view, you know, heroism and brotherhood, all of the, you know, all of the sort of issues that the, that the story plays with um, and brings it to a head in that movie. There's a really, like, drawn out epic fight scene between the two of them, um, which I think is something that had never been done before in any Ninja Turtle story was have two of the brothers actually fighting each other for real. Um, and it's so it's, you know, it, it resonated with me in a really kind of interesting way because it's like, yeah, this, you know, these two are the, are the turtles that, you know, where a lot of the drama is sort of fo- focused around, whereas the others uh, often just kind of provide a, a sort of support role. And then in the, in the new series, it's a very similar kind of thing where the drama of that whole series is about the tension and the relationship between Leonardo and Raphael. Well, and that's actually one of the things I really enjoyed about the new movie was how specific each of the turtles were. Like obviously going into it, we already, we already know their, their role, but this new movie, like they gave Donatello glasses and Raphael wears his mask. Like it's a do rag. And like Michelangelo has like, random necklaces on and things like that like you know like they're not only were their personalities so specific but just looking at them you instantly knew who all of them were um without even having to hear them speak it wasn't just a differentiation in the color of their masks it was like actually how they they looked and how they were standing and that kind of stuff they even had different teeth which i loved yeah, I, I agree. I, I think the the performances um of all the new turtles and and how they looked, like, look, they were gigantic and was that strange, sure, but but I think they really looked real. I mean, that sounds insane, but, you know, they looked like uh, sometimes when you when you have actors acting next to computers, uh, you know, CGI or whatever, it doesn't really feel integrated, but I completely agree with Allison. I mean, they were really four separate, you know, turtles and four separate personalities. It was great. Yeah, well, no, I mean, I thought I agree that they looked real and and they looked you know scary, which isn't how I really imagined them. But it, you know, they did look good in that sense. But I actually didn't like that either in that movie, in the two thousand seven movie, or in the new one, the turtles all fighting with each other. Because my conception of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is that they're just like all having fun and it's just a fun time, and they're all laughing and joking around and kicking butt. And I don't like it when they're just yelling at each other and squabbling. And I'm like, yeah, this isn't fun. You know, this isn't the the laugh stuff I signed up for. 
But I think, I think that's kind of like the teenage aspect of it, you know, like, uh, or when dogs like play fight and they look like they're fighting, but they're really playing. I think they kind of have that rough and tumble teenage nature, you know, maybe where they're kind of shoving each other around and it's not really like how adults would do it. I think they're just so, I don't know. That's kind of how I. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I liked it cause they, they are brothers and as someone who has a brother, we fight. You know, it's like they're family. They they should fight. It's a little weird if it's all, I, you know, it's good for kids when we go back and watch the TV show and they all just get along really well. But like as adults, you, I, I think you want to see sort of the the true nature of what family is. I think when when Leonardo and Raphael were facing off in this new movie, that, that doesn't look at all like play fighting to me. I mean, they look like they're ready to kill each other. Yeah, no, it's good. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, no, I know. I guess I didn't disagree with it at all, though. I think I, I found it kind of cool because I felt like we were sort of stepping into a moment that had a lot of backstory that we didn't get yet. You know, like we were meeting these guys right when they were at the the cusp of the the straw potentially breaking the camel's back, which I thought I I, don't, I mean, like I, I didn't think this new movie was anything great, but I really enjoyed the turtles in it. I wish there was more turtles and less humans. Well, and speaking of the backstory, there was quite a bit of backstory in this movie presented Which in fairly, no fairly awkwardly positioned flashbacks. So yeah. yeah, so strange. I thought the beginning. I, I, I thought. Uh, I thought it took too long to get to the turtles. I, I think like fifteen minutes to get to them is fine, but uh, you know they could have removed five minutes with that an, the animation in the beginning. I, I don't get what we got from that. Does any you guys remember that? It was like I don't even I don't even remember the animation so in the beginning. It was so weird. It was very It was just it seemed very out of place. That, that just whole, the, the oh the, like the credit sequence kind of thing. Yeah, but no, I think it was even after the it's, it was, was right after the credits. It was you're right. right. It was it was credits, like, they, they were kind of explaining the origin story, but it seems so odd to do that. Like. Like who is seeing? Who doesn't know the origin story? You know what I mean. And it, it wasn't like a totally new take on it. Um, I, I, I have a feeling that that the whole first half of that movie felt like a bunch of reshoots to make stuff make sense. So I have a feeling that that animation was added absolutely. after the fact, absolutely. like that. And the and you know right after um, April comes away from the comes away from the docks and she goes back to the the newspaper and then she, or the the news what channel 6 um and then she goes back to the docks she's like riding her bike and then there's a weird scene where she like pulls over and talks to some dude via FaceTime on her phone and he's like you know if you have any more questions just go back to the docks and talk to my dude and then all of a sudden she ends up at the docks at night and you're like that scene was added because they realized they had no reason for April to go back to the docks but like this dude on FaceTime never appears in the movie again you know, the the whole first 20, 30 minutes of the movie felt so piecemeal to me that I was like, just not into it. And then when the turtles finally got on screen and they were so fun, I was like, oh, thank God, at least here's something to watch, you know? Well, but I mean, in a sense, they had to cover the backstory because they had changed. I mean, you know, like in the cartoon, Splinter was a dude who had gotten turned into a rat man. Right. And then he found the turtles who had just gotten uh, ooze accidentally spilled on them, I think. That's how I remember it. Yeah, and yeah. And then they changed it in the first live action movie to make it so that Splinter was a rat originally who learned karate and then became a human, <laughs> like a human slash rat. And then this was even more random in this movie where he had like learned karate from a book. Yeah. And then... <laughs> Some for some reason he grew up faster than the turtles and stuff. I don't know all that stuff. Oh, I took it that to he was older in the lab, like when they had them in the labs. That oh, he so was... he was an oh, so he was an adult rat and they were baby turtles and that's yeah, why. That's, they, okay, all that's right. kind of how I took it. But yeah, it so but you know it's because I I believe they shot the whole movie. Remember that was that whole big controversy when Michael Bay came out and was like, yeah, they're actually going to be aliens, and everyone's like, what do you mean they're going to be aliens? They're mutants. They're not supposed to be aliens, you know. So I think they shot most of the movie with the turtles being aliens and then had to readjust it. So it's like, oh, no, they were mutants. And I think that's why the whole the whole backstory doesn't quite make sense. Huh. That's really interesting. Yeah. But the, the things that, that killed me were like, you know, when it, you know, it's because, you know, uh, April O'Neil saves them from uh, the, the lab fire and puts them in the sewer. Like, why would she put them in the sewer? They were her pets, kind of. And they were, you know, she loved those things. I'm like, if I saved the four little turtles, I would have just taken them home with me and kept them as pets. 
you know, it's like her dad dies in the in the fire, and then and at the end, it's like Shredder's like, no, I killed him, or not even Shredder, fucking the other dude. What's his name? Um, the Sh- Shredder's, uh, uh, you know, um, I don't, I don't even know. What just say William Fitchner. Yeah, but yeah, William <laughs> Fitchner. Yeah, William <laughs> yeah. Fitchner's like, no, I shot him, and you're like, what? What was the point of that? Why did we need that motivation? Like that made no sense to me. The strangest whatsoever. Thing, the strangest Shredder thing I think of all time was. Um, was like the big fight at the end on top of the tower. And I was getting back into the film. Like I loved the, the snow chase scene I thought was amazing. I thought that oh, was, yeah. I thought that was so much fun. And I was like so, slowly getting back into it. And then it's like Shredder like has these crazy hands and like a thousand knives and all this type of stuff. And he like approaches – I mean I, unless I'm going crazy and I totally envision this, doesn't he have just like a, like a MacBook set up? And he has like his like little tiny Shredder fingers come out like, like in gloves. And he's like typing on the computer, trying to get like the mute, the mutagen to come out. It was like, it was like he was kind of fending them off and like, wait a second, like, what's the Wi-Fi password? You know, like, I, <laughs> like it was like they should have had some lackey sign. Like, it was just the dorkiest. Like, how is this the baddest guy alive? You know, and he's and he's you know. I will be honest though. Those, those shredder, the the fact that he shot out knives and then he could like magnetically pull them back. That was really cool. No, that was great, but 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 did that happen or did I dream about this? I mean, no, yeah, insane? you're right. He goes yeah. up and, and types Beyond on. It's not insane. a MacBook, but yeah, he types on a little computer. Well, it was like a tough book. It was probably a tough book. A tough book. Whoever paid whoever paid the studio the money. That's right. who, yes. that's what that's what computer it was. But I thought that was really really strange. Yeah, I mean, the, it was not a perfect movie, but for me, like the scenes with the turtles, the, with the turtles and Will Arnett, I I think people can go see that movie solely for Will Arnett's performance because he's so freaking funny in it. Um, but you know, everything else, like there's another scene where they're, they have to get to the top of the building. So, you know, Donatello's like, we got to run through here and go to the elevators. And then they run through this door and there's like thousands of dudes with machine guns standing there who all just start firing at them and they run the other way and lock the doors. And they're like, can't take the elevator. And then literally the next scene is them in an elevator. But I love that. So explain to me, I know that (laughs) elevator scene is my favorite scene in the movie, mind you, but I feel like they shot the elevator scene and then, you know, <laughs> Had like it wrote themselves into a corner by having them not be able to go out that way. And then they're like, well, screw it. We still want the elevator scene in there. So I don't know. I, you know, there, there's just it had script problems. Let's just say that. <laughs> well, David, do you want to talk that snow um, action slide down the hill scene? You said you liked Would you want to talk about what 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 it was you liked about that scene? Yeah, I mean, I remember the trailer, the, the, the one image that always stuck with me in, in all the different um, trailers that I saw for the film was that kind of slow motion shot. I forget who it is, if it's Raphael or whoever. I think it's like Raphael, yeah. Doing the flip and slamming into the tank. And, I, and there was something, again, it was just, it, it. you watch some films with animation and CGI or whatever it is, and it doesn't look clean. and in Or it doesn't look in the environment. And to me, this really felt uh in the environment it reminded me of an old james bond movie i'm trying to think of which one it was when they're sli- i think it's a timothy dalton one i think it's uh the living, oh, daylights. Yeah, living daylights and they're sliding on the cello case like it, it, it was very emblematic of that which was just a fun scene you're taking something that's completely insane uh so you have this truck that's going off a cliff and or or james bond on the cello and bullets flying and all this stuff happening and it's and it's so unrealistic and, and in the wrong hands, it could be written off as the worst scene in the world. And I, and I got to give credit to the director and all the actors, I mean, for making that really the best scene. I just thought it was really exhilarating, action packed, um, perfect blend, uh, of the CGI, the humor, everything about it was, 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 I think a lot of fun. Yeah. They did a really good job of keeping the turtles personalities up and light and, and funny during this crazy action scene, which I think is really what the turtles are. Like, you know, they, they, they are action heroes and they, they do go off and fight all these baddies, but they do it with, with humor and jokes and, and that kind of stuff. And they didn't lose that in that scene, which I thought was really cool. And you know what this movie did a really good job of is having them really use their shells, which Beyond, like, the, you know, the jokes of them, like, pulling their heads in into their shells when someone, like, throws a punch at them. I don't feel like the TV shows and the movies have really done that. And these guys, like, this movie really utilized their shells a lot, which I liked. Yeah, cool. See, Matt, did you have any other things about this movie you wanted to say? Um, 
Yeah, well, it's a lot of it's been touched on already, I think. But I, I really love the the character design specifically. Just that they they the, they they felt more lived in in a lot of ways. They had scars and cracks in their shells, and oh, they you know they're wearing clothes, and they have just like they feel more like they exist in the real world. You know, I never quite got over the sort of spongy puppet, you know, style of the original films. Um, and I thought, you know, I thought the action sequences were good. Um, and, uh, I, I don't know. I just, I, I, I found a lot of it much more enjoyable than I thought I was going to. I, I went into it pretty cynical. Um, but it was a fun time. You know, the, the, the fight scenes were good and, um, you know, held my interest. Uh, I, I would like to see, I'd like to see another one that doesn't feel obligated to, to retell the origin. Um, because so much, kind of got cluttered in, I think, trying to stay true to the original story, set up this new world so that they could tell their story. It was weird, like, for a movie that that seemed to care so little about the sort of setup, it spent a lot of time on it. Um, so I, I'm i looking forward to seeing, a, you know, two hours of, you know, kung fu high kicking well you're in luck because they're already making the sequel so. <laughs> yay they're making a sequel it's been so long since hollywood's done that a sequel of a successful what? movie so that'll be great that'll be a great change of pace yeah <laughs> speaking of wearing clothes they didn't do the thing where the turtles wear their hats and trench coats and just walk around unobserved Oh, that's oh, right. That. <laughs> or, I forgot or the, about the that. groucho marx glasses uh which which matt talked about earlier they used right. to wear those too um, so, uh, what do you guys think? To, do you guys know anything about the sequel? Presumably, Shredder is going to come back as some sort of mutant or something. Is that what we're supposed to expect? Oh, because he got the ooze on him? Yeah, the, it's the last shot, he's lying dead or yeah. mortally wounded on the pavement, and then the ooze. It looks like he was sort of touching the ooze or something. That's that's how I interpreted yeah, it. Yeah, but wait, wasn't that the... Th- this, is, this confused me as well. Maybe you guys can tell me out with this. I thought that tube, right? It's the tube he grabbed from April... That contained the cure to this virus that they were going to plug out into the into the ozone, right? Didn't April get the cure? So that tube that was broken next to him was the cure. It was the what was in the it was the mutagen that was in the turtle's blood. But then they cut back to the turtles in the sewers with Splinter, and they're saving Splinter's life with the cure. So I that was something that confused me. I was like, wasn't the tube broken? Does anyone else remember this I, or, or am I, I crazy? Oh, I don't know. I'm, conf- I'm totally confused now. But I thought that he was, uh, Shredder was going to launch this stuff over the city and that was going to kill everyone. And that no, was no, no, no. He wanted to make everyone, sorry, he, he wanted to make everyone sick. So they kidnap the turtles and take their blood because their blood contains the mutagen. And in the mutagen is a cure to this virus that he wants to pump out over the city. So he can pump it out over the city and then he's the one with the cure. And then he makes like a billion dollars because of that. So he didn't want to actually kill everyone, but that's what I mean. So they, April had taken the tube of the stuff and one, I think it's like Raphael like yells to her, like, get it to splinter because this is what could save his life because he's dying. And then the tubes broken next to shredder, but then the very next scene they're saving splinter. See, none of this made sense to me. Well, maybe <laughs> this like, this was my like problem a, with the movies, but it might be like a flu vaccine where even though you're treating it, you're really putting the, the flu inside the person. So maybe I, I, I agree. I, I think, I think the point was that he's going to come back as some type of mutant, but I think they should forget about that and just bring back Krang because like, Yes. <laughs> like like a modern day Krang with our technology now would be pretty amazing. Yeah, and that was always my favorite part of the cartoon, all the more science fictional aspects and parallel worlds and all that kind of stuff. Well, then you should watch the new animated series on Nickelodeon because it was really that, goes back to the, <laughs> <laughs> it goes back to that style in a lot of ways. Um, the inter- you know, they reimagine everything for the new series. And one of the things that they do is they, they take Krang back to his comic roots, which is that he's actually, it's a race of these brain aliens that go around in human robot bodies to blend in. Um, and just the way that they're depicted in the show is so funny. Um, genuinely funny. Uh, it's really, really great uh, interpretation. And I think that they could do some weird stuff with it in a live action movie. Um, 
the, that sh- that show is actually I think really good. It was I think it was clearly designed um, with the intent that it would be a show that parents who were fans of the original series can watch it with their kids now, and everyone gets something out of it. There are a lot of callbacks to the old movies and the old cartoon, but it is updated in almost a sort of Pixar esque kind of way. Um, it does really have a, a a really nice charm to it. And I hear that the Mad Libs book that ties in with it is, is really quite well done. <laughs> Shameless plug. Uh, yeah, well, the Mad Libs book does is connected to the show, um, you know, story wise. But um, but the show itself, I'm not connected with the show in any way. And just as a fan um, who watched the first season, it's I mean, it's great. Um, you know, they have some they have some fairly big name actors in the show. And um, and it really I mean, the depictions of the four turtles are just so spot on. It's consistently funny. You know, I think it's it's definitely from that. Um, it's the Nickelodeon that made Avatar and Legend of Korra. Like, it's that kind of, like, much more sophisticated animation for the network. So I think it's great. I am, Matt, I am, I am curious about the Mad Libs book, though, because I, I didn't even know you had written this until you, you just mentioned it. But yeah. uh, how, what, is a tra- what does a TMNT Mad Libs book look like? Um, it, well, it's your standard book of Mad Libs, you know, the sort of um, skinny vertical book that flips from the top. Um, and just like any other sort of traditional Mad Libs book, it's stories about the turtles, um, and, uh, with all the blanks in that you can, you and your friends can, can fill in and come up with hilarious, um, you know, little short stories. My, my personal favorite is the one that talks about all of the turtles' favorite pizza recipes. Um, (laughs) you can imagine how gross that can get. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, they didn't they didn't capitalize that enough in the movie either. I mean, they were eating pizza, but not pizza with weird things on it because that was like their thing. Yeah, there was I think one in the original cartoon was refried clams. Ugh. I don't know what a refried clam is, but it sounds disgusting. Ugh. Um, all right, so we're running a little short on time here. I did want to ask uh, Allison and David about some stuff. So, so Allison, uh, we yeah. mentioned the last time you were on the show that you're on this show called the Team Unicorn Saturday Action Fun Hour. Yeah. And now it occurs to me that this is a, a show with four characters, all of who wear a different colored costume, right? Yeah. So is this the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for of today? Is this the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Uh, I mean, if it was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for adults, yeah, it could possibly be that. It's not. It's definitely... Even though it looks and sounds like a show for kids, it is definitely not a show for kids since it will hopefully be on Adult Swim. Um, but uh, but we, the four of us have talked about that and about which turtle we would be. And sadly, my character on Team Unicorn means that I am not Michelangelo. I am Donatello. Um, but uh, but yeah, we we definitely sort of fit that the uh, the characteristics of the turtles in in a lot of ways. So is your character, your character is kind of a, a science nerd kind of? Yes, or, I, okay. I am called the bookish one. I'm, I'm, I'm the nerdy. I'm kind of like the, the Velma, you know, if we're going to Scooby-Doo, hmm. I'm Velma. <laughs> <laughs> and do you guys eat pizza? We don't eat pizza. We wouldn't fit in our costumes if we did. <laughs> <laughs> we have to look very sleek in our animated selves. Um, but we definitely have like, a, you know, uh, the, the purple... The purple one is our leader. I, the colors don't match up, obviously, because like this wasn't something we thought of. But also, we didn't want to just copy Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Right, but uh, yeah. the purple, pur- the purple one is our is our leader, and and um, the green one, uh, she's our aggressive one. She'd be like our Raphael, and the pink one's like our Michelangelo. And I'm the blue one, and I'm like Donatello. <laughs> All right, cool. Sounds good. And so, uh, David, I, I, I mentioned uh, in your intro that you have a movie coming out called Turtle Island. Oh, yeah. Sounds uh, like something that might appeal to Turtles fans. Tur- uh, uh, maybe, maybe. It's uh, <laughs> it's kind of like a, a crazy uh, drama thriller um, found footage type film. And I actually I, I got the idea for it because I went camping and it, it turned out to be a really creepy camping trip. And where we were camping was called Turtle Island. So I stole it right from that. But um yeah, I mean that's the only no no Ninja Turtles in it, but hopefully that will come no, out soon. No Turtles period in it actually. But yeah, maybe yeah, no yeah, no turtle references, nothing. Um but a lot of a lot of violence and and a little gore, so maybe that's kind of Ninja Turtle-esque. Hmm. So do it do any of your other movies bear any sort of mutant ninja turtle influence? 
Um, <laughs> uh, let me think. No, I don't think so. One of my movies, the stand-up is set in the kindergarten. And if we want to really bring the conversation back, that's where I fell in love with the turtles to begin with. So I guess we, we could go there. But um, other than that, no. All right, cool. And so if people want to track all your projects and stuff, how, where do they follow you online? Um, I, I, you know what? It's, it's terrible because I'm such good friends with Allison and she is like the online queen. And you know what? I think I'm going to, I'm going to announce it here officially. Maybe you need to set some stuff up for me because I literally do uh -oh. not have, I do not have a Twitter. I do not have a Facebook. I have none of that. So I kind of just, when they come out on iTunes or in theaters, I, I blast it out like that. So just like if people want more information, they should just email Allison and show <laughs> That's exactly right. Allison's my publicist. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. And, and Allison, do you have any news or anything you want to mention? Uh, since uh, last time? Well, if you aren't one of the billion people who already watches NCIS, I will be on the season premiere in September. Uh, I think it's September 23rd. So check that out. Um, and hopefully, knock on wood, we should be hearing about this Team Unicorn Saturday Action Fun Hour if we're going to series in the next month or so. So It looks that amazing. Would, yeah. I, we we released a trailer at Comic Con and it it got a lot of love. So, so knock on wood. Come on, Adult Swim, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> and so, where where online would people keep an eye out for announcements about that? Oh, well, people can follow me on Twitter. Uh, it's just Allison Hayslip. Um, and I I tend to tweet out everything I'm doing. Probably much to the you know chagrin of some of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. And, and I mentioned Matt has uh, his first novels coming out, The Eighth Continent, in what, about a month now? He, we talked about it quite a bit on the last episode. Any uh, any updates on Matt you want to mention? Um, just a few weeks now. Yeah, it comes out September 16th. Uh, should be available everywhere. So look for The Eighth Continent. Yeah, it's going to be great. All right, cool. So I think we're going to wrap things up there. So uh, guys, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. And that was our panel. So thanks again to Matt London, Allison Hayslip, and David Wexler for joining us as guest geeks. And of course, big thanks again to Stephen Gould for being our guest today. Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including Philly Dragon Lady, who writes, I love these guys. One of my favorite things about this podcast is the extremely wide range of topics covered and guests they interview. I'm a huge sci-fi fantasy follower across all media, and these guys hit on all of it web comics, sci-fi fantasy novels and short stories, TV shows both new and old, even events related to nerddom, such as conventions. They've introduced me to a number of new authors and have discussed in detail some really fascinating topics. I love this show and the interview slash discussion format. Keep up the great work. So a huge thank you to Philly Dragon Lady for that great review. And of course, a very special thank you to all of our crowdfunders, including our latest crowdfunder, Jeff Gass, crowdfunder number 85, who also just became the latest listener to be making monthly contributions to the show. This episode was also made possible thanks to support from listeners such as Wes Weathersby, Nick Suffolk, Jason Lind, Laura Dirks, Zoe Akim, George Tricot, and Vlad Levin. So thanks, guys. We really appreciate it. To learn more, visit us at geeksguideshow.com and click on crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it... Tell no one. Thank you for listening. <laughs>